Okay. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second of the four pre kickoff uh, seminars. Um, as you know, we're intending to do one of these each week until the, the kickoff meeting uh, with a different science, fo science focus each week. Last week, we heard from Michael Coughlin about the MMA stuff. Um, and this week, um, I believe we're hearing from Mia and HEP. Yep. Right. So if you'd like to take it away, Mia, thank you. Okay. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll get started. So I'll talk about the E33 uh, HEP you know, activities, um, specifically how do we want to improve the uh, discovery potentials with the artificial intelligence at the LHC. Um, so, you know, just in case you are not working on particle physics, uh, we actually do something that's pretty crazy that we try to recreate the universe right after the Big Bang. That's, you know, 10 to the minus 10 second. So we can see how um, things evolved since then. Um, for such a crazy project, right, we have a very good um, model that could describe many things we observe in the collider experiments we build on Earth. Um, and to summarize how um, many particles have we discovered and how do they interact with each other, uh, we have the standard model of fundamental particles, um, where you know exactly how many particles you expect and how do they interact with each other. And everything is summarized very beautifully in a mathematical uh, formulation that you can do calculations with the uh, quantum field theory. So it has been uh, pretty successful. Um, and in fact, the last missing piece of the standard model was the Higgs boson and was discovered in 2012 at the uh, Large Hadron Collider located at CERN, Switzerland. So it's uh, this uh, 27 kilometer accelerator ring where we uh, accelerate proton beams and collide them at different experimental sites. Then we built this huge uh, detectors underground, uh, about 100 meters underground, to try to see what comes out of the collisions. Uh, for example, you know, the Higgs boson was discovered uh, jointly by ATLAS and CMS experiments, where the specific design of these giant machines are uh, different, but the detection um, experimental technology are comparable um, between these two. So just as, as an example to, sh example to show you how we found the Higgs boson uh, is by detecting these particles that come out of the collision. So um, for example, the Higgs boson decays to other particles and the type of particles we can detect uh, are these few um, as shown in this slide. So in the inner, um, part. This is kind of the cross section of our, of our detector. And the very inner part is the charged particle tracker. And uh, these um, are used to, to detect the charged particle trajectories because they bend in the magnetic field that's produced by this superconducting solenoid. So in CMS, we have a four Tesla um, magnetic field. So something that's charged, such as electrons or um, charged hadrons, such as pions, they would curve in the mag magnetic field, uh, and we can reconstruct the momentum uh, and kinematics of these particles. Um, and after that, there's the calorimeter. So I have the electromagnetic calorimeter and also hadronic calorimeter. Um, so, for example, things that interact only electro, uh, magnetically, such as electrons or photons, would deposit most of the energy in the uh, electromagnetic calorimeter. So from this energy deposit, we can um, measure how much energy these particles are carrying. Uh, and for these uh, hadrons that interact strongly with the uh, hadronic calorimeter, we can also measure the energy uh, of these particles. And for muons, they um, interact minimally with the detector and uh, they are detected by the inner tracker and also the muon chambers that's outside of the solenoid in CMS. So for Atlas is slightly different, but the ideas are uh, very similar. And to discover the Higgs boson, we actually discover you know, what comes out of the Higgs boson decay. So we produce the Higgs boson in the proton-proton collision. And the Higgs boson decay, it can go through different uh, modes. 
Um, and the channels we rely on for the discovery was actually the more clean, although rare processes, for example, uh, in this uh, event display is showing the atlas detector, where you have the Higgs boson uh, produced, and it decays to two Z bosons, which are also very heavy, so these decay right away. Um, what eventually you see in the detector are actually these muons and electrons uh, that's detected. Then you can measure the properties of these particles and try to reconstruct what happened in the collision in order to find the Higgs boson. Um, so as I mentioned, these are actually rather uh, rare um, decay modes of the Higgs boson. For example, only less than you know, 3% of the Higgs boson decays to ZZ. Uh, a large part of the Higgs boson decay, uh, that's 2 BB bar, that's 60%. Actually, it's uh, even more challenging to measure um, for several reasons. The first is that uh, we have much larger overwhelming background. So up to the 10 to the seventh more frequent background for Higgs to BB decay. Um, and uh, these Higgs decays to B hadrons, which are long lived. So they can travel a little bit in your detector. Um, so it's a bit more complex than, for example, electrons and muons we detect. Um, all of these things you know, contribute um, and make this uh, Higgs to BB detection almost impossible. So that's where, uh, you know, um, where we started exploring more like machine learning based techniques, uh, multivariate techniques, starting from BDT and uh, more neural networks. So um, for example, here, so you have a Higgs decays to BB bar B hadrons, and they travel a little bit. So you have um, a displaced uh, vertex and displayed tracks. And the decay products coming from this uh, B hadrons are also tend to be very very soft. So, um, with you know, only with the machine learning techniques, multivariate techniques, we can do rather good discrimination of this Higgs to BB um, classification against, uh, for example, a background event. Um, so, on the right side, um, the, in this plot, is showing the uh, rock curve of how well we can detect the Higgs to BB decay. Um, so this blue curve is a boosted decision tree based method that I use more derived of, um, expert features as inputs. Uh, for example, if the particles decays uh, from here and also the secondary vertices. Um, so we were able to improve right, how well we can detect the Higgs 2 BB decay with more advanced techniques, uh, neural networks, for example, recurrent neural networks and convolution neural uh, convolutional neural networks. And more recently, um, the, there's a large uh, improvement brought from using this graph neural networks, which I will get into more you know, details later uh, on, on this application. But basically you can build uh, a graph uh, using the particles uh, from the B hadron decay and also the secondary vertices and build the um, homo inhomogeneous graph and try to identify uh, these Higgs 2 BB decays. So this is kind of, you know, to show you how, um, where we can get uh, machine learning to help us with our uh, physics goals. Um, and of course, um, we have good reasons to believe that the standard model is incomplete. Uh, to some, um, at some energy level, we don't know. Um, so theoretically, we know that uh, we have a 125 GeV uh, Higgs boson that uh, in theory, it would receive the uh, loop contributions from the standard model particles based on uh, quantum field theory. So if you take all the physics valid to Planck, Planck scale, that's the energy scale where Big Bang happens, um, then there's this epsilon number that needs to be really fine, uh, finely carefully tuned in order to make this 125 GeV um, Higgs boson. So we often refer this to, uh, you know, as the unstable Higgs mass or fine tuning problem. Um, but for the Higgs field itself, uh, we don't really know why it's the way it is. You know, at the beginning of the universe, you have a para more parabolic type of shape. And then at some point this phase transition happens and uh, all the particles acquire mass, uh, but we don't know the dynamical region of this. And of course, experimentally, the standard model is not complete because we don't include the dark matter, dark ma energy candidates, which convincingly from uh, cosmological um, observations, we know um, there is dark matter and dark energy. And also we don't know about the origin of neutrino masses, which, um, we know neutrinos are massive because uh, they oscillate. 
and uh, there are a couple more, you know, experimental anomalies in the uh, charged uh, lepton um, sectors that uh, tend to in, uh, indicate, you know, maybe the lepton flavor violation uh, university is violated. Um, so, um, and there are beyond the standard model theories, which can give uh, good explanations and also solutions to many of the problems or include some of the experimental um, anomalies or try to address those uh, in one theory. So, um, you know, for example, supersymmetry uh, was very popular um, because it solves the problem of st stabilizing the Higgs boson mass by canceling the top loop contribution with this uh, uh, scalar top pattern uh, partners. Um, and uh, also, you know, it has a dark matter candidate uh, that comes for free. That's the most stable on the particle in um, SUSY. Um, but, you know, we were able to perform and search for these particles really extensively, and we were able to study a large parameter space in theory that was not possible with the LHC uh, data set. And here's just a few plots to show you uh, how far we've made, right, uh, for the stop pair production, for example, we were able to push things more towards like TEV scale. So everything inside this loop will be uh, excluded. Um, for the for the theor uh, theoretical uh, phase space we're studying. Um, and, you know, we were also able to study more rare processes in the electroweak sector of the uh, su supersymmetry particles, which is less um, often that happens in the uh, in our collider, but also um, theoretically as valid to solve some of the problems I mentioned. We also have a very uh, extensive dark matter searches uh, but, you know, we are very good at placing limits. Um, so the question is, are we doing the best we can? Uh, if you zoom out a little bit to look at the uh, theory parameter space, we look at the LHC, we are actually quite constrained uh, because of how we designed our um, detectors to, to be, you know, sensitive to searching for the Higgs, for example, and SUSY particles, which tend to be what we call prompt signatures that tend to uh, decay in the um, beam pipe once it's produced. And all of these tend to have high, relatively high energy. So we kind of uh, constrain our search space in this box that uh, uh, if the new particle, the BSM particle beyond the standard model particle is either low mass or weakly coupling, um, then we lose sensitivity uh, of searching for these particles. So the general direction of where we're you know, going at the LHC is to look for this very low mass and very uh, weakly coupling particles and um, that's very challenging for our detector to detect and analyze. Um, some of these would resolve in uh, some unconventional we call signatures, which tend to live a bit longer than the uh, normal signatures we look for and decay in the detector instead of uh, inside the where the proton-proton beam uh, collide and um, happens. So many of these are limited by the online data collection of our experiments, simply because we didn't build the LHC to look for this type of events. Uh, and currently we would rely on something, you know, accidentally you would have another object that you would trigger on uh, to, to study these signatures. So this is a, um, something we can improve in, in the future. Um, and also going towards the higher energy uh, regime. So the LHC has the highest energy proton-proton collision. Uh, and there are several things we can do to improve our sensitivity of studying new physics that's more like uh, at the you know energy level we can reach with the experimental um, condition. So one example I showed is to improve our detection for this very very energetic high PT objects, for example, the Higgs two uh, BB decay. And also you can go another route if the you new know, physics is uh, really like orders of magnitude beyond what we can do at the LHC. Some of these would come in loop contributions and you can calculate the correction of these uh, really heavy particles and they would modify some uh, of the rates of very rare processes. Um, so one example is a lepton uh, flavor violating process. Uh, and interestingly, you know, for these signatures, some of them would produce rather soft, low PT 
uh, signatures that we are also, you know, not very sensitive to uh, the LHC, um, like how we designed it to be. So I kind of, you know, discuss how we can improve um, some of these directions with machine learning. Um, and um, another side of the story is more like the, uh, the, the very challenging experimental condition at the LHC. So we have proton-proton collisions at um, every 25 nanosecond. Um, the LHC is very good at increasing the uh, amount of collisions they deliver by packing as many protons as possible in each beam uh, crossing. Um, so to increase the probability of these protons colliding. Um, so which means you can have multiple pro protons uh, colliding in each uh, beam crossing. So this is good for increasing the luminosity, which means we have more statistics to study our um, you know, theories that new, new physics we're looking for. Uh, but it also it's very challenging experimentally because essentially uh, you're only interested in one uh, interaction that happens in this uh, per bunch crossing, and then you have other ones that also produces particles, but these are considered noise that you need to subject uh, from. And uh, from a detector point of view, uh, that's only from you know the, the production point of view, how many Higgs bosons you can produce, for example, how, many, uh, how much data rate you're dealing with, um, and uh, from the detector point of view, it's kind of like you're uh, trying to find, um, you know, some anomalous raindrops from a, a rainfall, right? Like when you have like lo uh, lighter rain and heavier rain, of course, with heavier rain, you have larger statistics to work with, but then you need uh, faster cameras, which means you want faster shutter speed and probably higher resolution pictures that you take in order to really resolve what happened uh, in this event. Um, so often we found ourselves uh, in building faster um, detector electronics, detectors, and also uh, with finer granularity, so we have more readout channels, in order to collect enough information that comes out of the collision to reconstruct what happened, whether there's new physics inside. Um, and uh, you know, and often we found that uh, machine learning can help us with improving many aspects of this. So um, another, uh, I guess, story is that we found ourselves using more and more, uh, even more graph neural networks, uh, simply because I think um, it's a very natural rep representation of the data we collect in our detector from raw uh, detector input level to reconstructed particles. You can imagine that you can represent a char par charged particle leaving like hits in the tracker, and you can represent each of these hits as a node, and you can connect these nodes uh, with edges and try to build the whole uh, charged particle trajectory. So, and also when you have uh, reconstructed particles, you can represent these particles as a node and how they interact with, with each other as uh, edges. So graph neural networks has a formulation that helps us to represent this uh, irregular and structural data, and also has a way to explore the relations between these uh, nodes, so our measurements or particles. Um, so graph neural networks, um, a lot of the, these, you know, mathematical formula, formulas was driven by uh, social media data and how to adapt and adapt to, to our domain knowledge that we perhaps know there's some uh, embedded uh, symmetry or structure that we can take uh, advantage of or to embed this uh, domain knowledge would be interesting to explore and uh, how to formulate the uh, problem depending on the target you're trying to hit is also interesting. Uh, so in general, you know, there are like uh, several categories we can classify the GN applications in particle physics. And uh, so I have, we have the node classification graph edge, or you can try to identify subgraphs that belongs to the the whole set. So um, I have a few examples, which I, yes, by definition biased. Uh, so some of most of these are work by, you know, done by the um, E3D3 members, but hopefully I can give you a, um, I can illustrate the general idea about how to formulate a particle physics um, detection question 
as a graph neural network um, problem and to so how to uh, solve those problems. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, PyUp is uh, kind of a general problem um, challenge for all kinds of particle uh, physics analysis these days, not only the uh, unconventional ones, but also uh, if we detect a particle, we want to know how much noise is contributing to that. So this is kind of the uh, situation we're dealing with, you know, we have a 100 proton-proton um, collisions and we only use one of these as the um, interaction of interest to, to do physics analysis of um, of course, this, it's obvious that uh, it's essential to the LHC physics program overall because we need to understand when we reconstruct a particle, how many constituents of this particle are actually coming from noise uh, interactions from high up interaction and uh, be able to remove these. Um, and to do this, we have two classes of particles. So we have the charged particles and neutral particles. Um, so charged particles will bend in the uh, tracker, and since we have very excellent detection in the tracking system, we're able to take the trajectories of these particles and reconstruct and distinguish the pi up interaction where they come from from the uh, primary primary vertex that uh, we're interested in studying. Um, so these are easy, but uh, what's tricky is the neutral particles that we don't have the tracking information to associate them with which interaction point they come from. So often you have to rely on some uh, transferred features to subtract this um, energy of the neutral particles in order to, uh, to, to do, do this. Um, so um, as an example of a node classification for graph neural networks, uh, we did a study um, to apply this um, uh, graph neural networks with the semi-supervised setting. So basically uh, the setting is that you know the association of the charged particles to the primary primary vertex and also pi up uh, vertex um, for the charged particles. You can train a feature extractor or classifier with graph neural networks that learns about the surrounding uh, environment of this particle that can be transferred to neutral particles. So when you're trying this, of course, you don't want to use the charge specific uh, features. So we remove those from this training. Um, but uh, you know, once you learn this uh, classifier uh, about this surrounding uh, environment of the charged particles, you can apply this to the neutral particles uh, and try to label the neutral particle as um, interesting from the primary vertex or from pi up vertex. Um, so we did a study of this and uh, it outperforms the uh, expert feature based method, which is a similar idea, but you extract the surrounding information uh, from domain knowledge based uh, feature extraction. And uh, this is also comparable to a fully supervised method. So it's easier to see perhaps in this uh, rock curve uh, where, you know, better is like top left direction. And uh, you can see from the log scale better how the uh, graph neural network based methods outperforms the red one, which is the expert uh, feature based method. And uh, this uh, green and blue line represents the separate uh, semi supervised where you learn from charged applied to neutral and fully supervised meaning you uh, know about the neutral particle labels uh, just to see whether you have uh, performance degrade degradation from a fully supervised setting to semi-supervised setting. And the uh, performance drop is quite uh, negligible. Um, so we presented this um, in conferences and there's uh, papers coming soon. So this is in collaboration with Pan, uh, who is also part of the A3D3 uh, community. So we are um, interested in applying this to um, semi-simulation and uh, real data. Um, you know, moving forward, uh, perhaps we can address some of the more challenging scenarios where in the forward detect region, we don't have neutral particle vertex association. Uh, how do we do this pi up subtraction? Uh, and perhaps looking into if we have the association of these pi up particles to which vertex it belongs to, including neutrals and charged particles, can we do physics with this uh, pi up interaction? Um, 
Okay, so that was a case for more like node classification application of graph neural networks. Uh, as I mentioned, we can also do um, graph level uh, classification. The Higgs 2BB tagger is kind of an example of those. Um, but here I'll show you also an ongoing study in collaboration with Pan uh, at Purdue, trying to detect some of the very um, soft, very challenging signatures at the uh, SMS. So um, this is, we call tall two, three mu. So tall are tall is the, you know, third generation lepton and mu one's the second generation. And uh, if we believe there's a lepton uh, flavor universality, uh, this tall two, three mu event would never happen at tree level. Uh, they can only happen with loops that uh, violates the uh, that's through neutrino oscillations as shown in this uh, plot uh, in this diagram on the left here. So since they're like loop contributions, they're like super rare in the SANA model. So it's 10 to the minus 14 uh, branching fraction. Uh, if you have a new physics that comes at tree level, for example, from uh, our parity of violating SUSY, uh, this process would have uh, enhanced production. Uh, to you know the order of uh, 10, 10 to the minus um, eight. So, but these things are really difficult to to detect in CMS because um, specifically for tau two three mu, we have the D mesons that decays to tau uh, that decays to three muons, and that's the main source of tau's we uh, use. Um, and since the D meson and tau are very close in mass, so these three muons that come from this decay are very collimated, very uh, soft, and tend to populate in the end cap of our detector. Um, so to, traditionally, we don't really optimize for this type of detection. Um, and for the next upgrade of CMS, we actually use the uh, inflammation with better resolution from the tracking uh, systems. But even with that, we can only detect 25% of the uh, decays. So on the right side, you can sort of see uh, where this, um, so this is the muon PT spectrum for this tau two, three mu events uh, for, for the three muons, the blue ones, the leading PT muon, and um, as we go down, go softer. Um, and just as a comparison for the online filtering for the triggers we have now for single muon, dimuon triggers, we are more like 20 GeV, you know, 10 to 20 GeV. Um, so you really need specialized triggers to, to uh, detect these type of particles or processes. Um, so we are working on this graph neural network based, uh, um, you know, whole graph classification that takes the muon hits that includes the coordinates of these hits from the measurement in your muon chamber and represent this as nodes in a graph. Uh, we have an attention-based graph neural network um, to aggregate information between hits from different layers and uh, from different uh, measurements. And also uh, there's a global node to aggregate this information. And then you can do a classifier training signal mixed with your background noise coming from pi up and versus pure um, no noise coming from pi up. Um, and we were able to do like 90% efficient. And this is, uh, you know, some number you can compare to, to this 25% efficient. So we are, in, uh, you know, excited about this, um, but this is kind of an end to end approach where we know there's a tau three mu with the what probability, but uh, to reconstruct the full kinematics, uh, you probably want to take, for example, shown here, uh, it's the eta versus phi plane of the hits coming from different stations of the muon chamber. Uh, and you want to be able to take this information and reconstruct what really happened in the event. Um, so for example, if we're lucky to, to see some enhancement in some uh, in this process, and then you want to be able to know what's the properties of these particles that end up having um, producing these hits in your detector. Um, and try to trace what new physics physics it could be. So that you know um, involves some uh, reg regression and uh, uh, such. And uh, I'm also interested in studying how we can adapt this type of neural networks to other type of physics signatures, for example, long-lived ones or outside of the uh, outside of CMS, and uh, to test how adaptive machine learning methods can be. Um, 
Okay, so that's that's more like an end-to-end, -end, uh, given what raw uh, detector inputs, and you get an answer of whether this is interesting or not. Uh, but in reality, traditionally, how we do physics in at the LHC is more like staged uh, reconstruction. So first, you have the tracking information detected by your tracker left by charged particles, and try to connect the dots to reconstruct the charged uh, particle trajectories with the measurement of the you know the momentum and the uh, bending all these things. And uh, in the electromagnetic calorimeter, you try to find clusters of deposits of uh, energy and you collect all this information, try to you know, combine them, link them, and uh, to, to come up with you know, whether this is a muon or charged hadron uh, or photon and neutral uh, hadron based on the characteristics and of, you know, combinations you can make. Um, and this is called the uh, particle flow reconstruction in CMS. And, and after that, you take these reconstructed particles and try to, to reconstruct what physics process uh, actually happened in this collision. Um, so today, um, I will show you know, some studies uh, that uh, our you know, FUDF members are doing uh, in the tracking and also particle fluid reconstruction. So this is not very, uh, you know, the most inclusive, but just to give you some ideas of where we can apply. Uh, these graph neural networks. Um, so for particle tracking, as I mentioned, you basically take the measurements that's left by uh, these charged particles in the tracking devices. So we have layers of this and you would have hits. And then uh, after this layer, there's some spatial um, separation and you have the second hit. So the task here would be to identify uh, between layers and uh, cross layers, which connection is the right connection. So often we form formulate the, this problem as an edge classification uh, question. So, um, and the reason for using machine learning, um, it's actually mo mostly motivated by speeding up the algorithms. Because uh, traditionally we, we use like a common filter based method that goes uh, outside of the detector and uh, goes back in. It actually works pretty well from accuracy point of view, uh, but it's very computationally expensive and uh, it's by nature a sequential algorithm. So we can't really easily take advantage of this uh, uh, coprocessors, for example, heterogeneous computing like uh, GPU coprocessors in order to speed up these uh, algorithms. So you have to do some smart tricks in order to do that. Uh, and the idea of applying machine learning is that, you know, often the computation in neural networks are parallelizable by definition. So uh, we want to see if we can do efficient tracking with machine learning. Um, so in this uh, slide, I'm showing some examples, also studies done by uh, our D3D, uh, A3D3 uh, members um, for um, accelerating tracking um, reconstruction. So very specifically, this is targeting uh, very resource constrained scenarios on FPGAs. Uh, and uh, we were able to demonstrate, you know, for a graph that has 112 nodes and 148 edges. Um, if you go to like a 12 bits, uh, precision, you can achieve quite high uh, precision. And also this one is showing some of the uh, timing performance in terms of latency. So it's, uh, so this is in terms of cycles. Uh, if you do like 170 times five, that's less than one microsecond for this graph, uh, for this edge uh, inference. So we were able to, you know, implement a, uh, a GN on FPGAs to that this particle tracking that's quite efficient, um, but this is targeting kind of small um, application. Okay, so uh, this is the first step of the reconstruction at the LHC where you build tracks and clusters. Another example is how to take these tracks and clusters and uh, you know, combine them and reconstruct the particles that actually were detected. Um, so here I'm showing an example of this um, uh, particle flow with machine learning. So basically the problem um, you're trying to solve is to take these clusters. So for example, this plot is showing uh, these blue ones are from electromagnetic 
uh, calorimeter clusters and the orange ones are the hadronic calorimeter clusters. You want to take all these clusters and try to see whether you can combine these with the tracks that's showing gray uh, here and come with another set that's um, representing your particles. So basically from like a machine learning language, we're trying to do a set to set uh, translation. Of course, we want to combine this set to, uh, you know, in a meaningful way so we can have the regressed particle properties to match what we expect in our um, generator level, which means we know th what the true particle should look like. Um, and this uh, graph neural network based approach um, tend to, you know, it was shown to perform really well um, based on Adolphi's data set. So this left plot is showing the uh, classification um, performance. So basically, you know, if you have a muon, how often do you reconstruct the muon as a real muon? Uh, so you, ideally you want things to be a diagonal, but of course there's limitations of how well we can separate electrons and gamma, for example. So we have some confusion here. Um, and then for, you know, uh, to reconstruct the properties of the particles, you want to learn about the momentum, uh, you want to learn about which direction it's traveling to. Uh, so this here on the right side is showing the regressed um, value by the graph neural network compared to the real um, value. And this is also compared with the root base to which is the blue one. So uh, overall, um, the machine learning based method performs the same or even better with the, uh, than the root based particle flow algorithm, um, which is encouraging. Um, so the previous uh, examples I showed you kind of um, it, it really helps to improve a lot of discovery potentials, given that you know where you're looking for. Um, this um, slide is showing another way we're going in our searches, which is what if we don't know where we're looking for this signal, so we don't know what to design to improve the, the detection efficiency to improve, you know, maximize that. Um, so basically, you can build this autoencoders that learns a uh, representation of your standard model particles based on the uh, distributions that you gave it, and uh, try to identify and treat this as uh, more like an anomaly detection problem uh, in case you don't know where the new physics might pop up. Um, okay, so um, all the above ones are more like, uh, I hope that uh, the, the problem formulation was and motivation was clear. Uh, in reality, a lot of these algorithms, we need to uh, either apply them in the online filtering. So we have better signal acceptance that fits the bandwidth we, we can read out from. Uh, and also for offline computing, you want something that's efficient and fast enough so uh, we can fit the computation uh, within the resources we have. So the question is how we can be fast en enough. Um, and uh, of course, you know, fast enough is up to your interpretation and really depends on which system you're working with uh, and uh, what uh, metric would be most important for your problem. Um, at the LHC, we kind of have a spectrum of uh, different data processing requirements. So we have proton-proton collision at uh, 40 megahertz. So every 25 second, nanosecond, we have collisions. Uh, we have billions of channels that read out detectors with many bits uh, that uh, we cannot really read out everything off. So only part of the uh, information is passed to the, we call level one trigger. So it's the FVGA based uh, trigger system in CMS, for example, where uh, a quick decision has to be made about whether this is interesting or not within the time budget, about one microsecond, uh, because the raw information is sitting on detector on the electronics and you only have so much buffer. Um, so after this uh, level one trigger processing filtering, we reduce the rate to 100 kilohertz. Uh, where, where it gets further reduced down to one kilohertz, where we have a high level trigger system that's based on like a CPU farm. So you can have a bit more time uh, storage for your input, input data to make a better decision about whether this, in, this is interesting or not. And uh, what comes out of HLT uh, gets 
sent to offline data processing where it's distributed around the world. Uh, you, can, you might want to do multiple processing. So you might want to do multiple track re uh, reconstruction, for example. So uh, for the level one, the main uh, concern or restriction that's more strict than a lot of systems is, is the latency. Um, so you need to make a decision in one microsecond level and you have several you know, applications coming from different parts of the detector, which means that each of these algorithms uh, tend to consume about 100 uh, nanosecond, or much, not much more. So uh, this is very uh, targeted systems in the A3D3 language, right? Where you have high bandwidth, very low latency processing uh, using specialized computing hardwares. And for the um, HLT and offline computing, uh, where you know it's traditionally CPUs, multi-threaded multi uh, computing, um, and, but we're in you know moving towards more uh, increasingly heterogeneous uh, systems. For example, by including GPUs in our HLT or offline computing, um, and uh, in the fast machine learning community, we have we have been you know pursuing solutions for both of these areas of applications. Um, for the FPGA implementations that's targeting specialized systems, um, we have this uh, HLS4ML um, project, which you probably heard something about, but I think we'll hear more about this in the future, which, uh, you know, it stands for High Level Synthesis for Machine Learning. Um, basically, uh, when we try to think about how do we program these neural networks on FPGAs for our trigger applications, uh, with you know, there was a missing uh, link between the machine learning world and how to program FPGAs, especially for domain experts who might not have the knowledge of programming FPGAs or both uh, knowledge of, you know, developing a neural network and also program uh, FPGAs. So this has been a very, uh, you know, active and successful effort. And we are, uh, we have multiple applications in CMS that are being uh, deployed using HLS for ML. Uh, for example, we have the Muon PT regression in NCAP, where uh, it's based on a fully connected network. And we have um, other triggers being deployed, including some of the anomaly detection uh, ones I mentioned. Um, and for the HLT and offline computing world, um, the challenges are um, a bit different. Here you are more relaxed in, in the latency, actually, you know, uh, a CPU, multiple uh, thread based a CPU plus a GPU attached to a local machine sometimes will work. Um, so here the challenge is more like these hardwares are more you know, they're expensive and often how you set up the computing uh, paradigm um, determines, right, how cost effective your um, solution is. Uh, for example, buying, you know, individual GPUs for all the CPU nodes, perhaps depending on your application is not the most cost effective way. And you also have a real uh, dependence on the hardware you purchase and decide to use. So we kind of explore a machine learning as a service. Uh, we call this Sonic project where uh, we are exploring a more cost-effective where you can saturate your GPU usage, for example, um, that provides more flexibility. We can do GPU coprocessors, we can uh, work with FPGA coprocessors, and also more scalable. Um, and also plus bonus is that uh, it's a pain to include these machine learning packages in uh, software stacks such as CMS uh, software stack. So it also reduces the software um, maintenance because you offer this to the server side. Um, so we are also, you know, pursuing applications in CMS data processing uh, in multiple workflows uh, for both machine learning and non-machine learning um, CUDA code. Uh, that's for HLT. Um, okay, so here's my summary. So I think, I hope I convinced you that machine learning offers opportunities to help us to discover new physics at the HC. Um, and uh, to do this often, we need accelerated machine learning inference in either online uh, processing or offline processing. And many of these uh, implementations would require a multidisciplinary team to, to realize the optimal um, implementation. 
uh, for both targeted systems and uh, uh, heterogeneous computing systems. Uh, and we, we uh, really need user-friendly tool for domain experts in order to streamline the process from ideas to implementation. Um, and uh, my you know, discussion today is perhaps a bit biased towards like what I do now and uh, what people do in AFID3 uh, for the HEP community. So there's a lot of graph neural networks um, and uh, mostly you know, focus on reconstruction. But there's also other areas that we can explore in the future, for example, how to speed up simulation, which is also relevant for our uh, computing, and also you know, online uh, experimental control and calibration, uh, which is also you know, um, could benefit from the real-time inference of machine learning methods. So I look forward to, to working with people in EVD3 and in particular, um, whether we can identify synergies in machine learning uh, method development based on the commonality and uh, synergies of our applications and problems we are trying to tackle, and also advance you know, our machine learning methods implemented on uh, targeted and uh, heterogeneous uh, computing systems with the um, engineering and computer science uh, experts, for example. Um, that's what I have for today. Thank you very much, Mia. That was a great overview of, well, you know, as an astronomer, I found this was a great overview of HGP and what's going on. So very informative. Um, so um, questions, please, from anyone. Either on chat or raise your hand. Phil. Hi, yeah, sorry, it's a, it's a bit of a physics question for Mia. Um, for the okay. task of community analysis, um, yeah. I'm wondering, I, were you thinking about using this in a scouting system? I think it's possible, um, but you know, even without scouting, you can, you can, do, you can do this with the 90% efficiency so it wouldn't improve things much. With the 20 GV muon PT trigger? So. Oh, I don't know if you can like trigger this events in the 20 GV one. Yeah, that's, that's my point is that the trigger right. level, like, like I, I'm pretty sure like the trigger level, I don't know how you would get these, right? Yeah, so so um, th this is what I'm saying. This is not the scouting. This oh, is the I mean, nominal I mean, trigger I mean, system. I mean, yeah, that you you can just pass things through and it would fit how much you can read out in the normal muon trigger system. I see. And this passes, like, have you done, have you run the signal, like 200 pileup, it passes, like the trigger? Uh. You mean the single muon trigger? Or the dimuon? Or the dimuon. Uh, we haven't tested that. Yeah, because because like naively, I would have expected this to be. I mean, I agree that like with you know, like you know, normal pileup, it's probably doable, but like, you know, at very high pileup, it might be a challenge to, to get like so good this right. Yeah. So this ninety percent. So this is actually two hundred pi up. Okay. So we measured the trigger event with with the with the two hundred pi up sample. I see. Okay. So you've done the trigger studies. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I was hoping this would be a fun scouting example, but if it's already triggerable, then it's fine. Yeah. I mean. Oh, yeah. You can see, I, I think to me more like this project uh, where it's going is, yes, you can trigger on this event, but can you actually reconstruct the event? It's, it's a, a bit uh, No, 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 I, I, I think it's a great study, right? And it's a great analysis. And yeah, there's a huge ambiguity here for how you want to reconstruct these. Um, I was just, so, so let me explain to everybody is that scouting, what that is, is um, basically real time what we call real-time analysis of the data. Some people call it trigger level analysis. 
And so the idea is that you take data and you do the analysis simultaneously. Um, the only reason I ask here is that um, as an application of A3D3 scouting is like scouting analyses are like great examples because you have to run them fast. Um, and and because, because basically the idea is that um, you don't save these events and later on downstream because they're, they're, they just look like most of them are garbage. And so you want to basically do pre the processing re in real time. Um, I thought these might be scouting events, I, I mean, but yeah, it, it's fine. I mean, I still I, think it's an interesting problem, right? I, I, I think it's definitely possible, right? Especially if we don't, don't want to go through the process of adding a trigger line for this specific application or replace what's in there now, right? There are all bits of things you have to compete for. <laughs> so I think scouting will be interesting, yeah, for, from that implementation uh, consideration. Yeah, but I mean, this is a great like example anyway, because uh, it's an interesting problem. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can talk more. Offline too. Okay. Any other questions from here? Well, if not, uh, people are, of course, free to continue discussion on Slack and um, all the other channels that we are now getting for communication. So um, thanks again, Mia. Um, I believe next week is. Um, Amy Osborne and neuroscience. So same time. Otherwise, everyone have a good week and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.